Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third Thoughts on Thursday series with the GrowthWorks Network. Uh, really excited to have so many of you um, back again. I've been really looking forward to this session um, to get the owner perspective, not just on the crisis, but on the recovery. I think as, as operators, marketeers, salespeople, HR leaders, and of course, you know, early career leaders, we've all been thinking about our own jobs and supporting our teams and what to do next. But I think it's fascinating to step back and think, well, what's actually happening with those real estate owners? You know, these people who are betting hundreds of millions of dollars on the hospitality industry for the long term. Um, how are they thinking right now? What are they planning? And of course, what do they need from us as early career and middle management and senior leaders in the industry? So I'm delighted that Mahir can spare the time to, to join us. Um, Mahir is based out in Asia, um, running a, a real estate company that own Taj, Accor and Hilton Brands. I'm sure he will uh, share, share a bit more of that with us, but um, we're delighted to have him with us to uh, present. So Mahir, over, over to you. Uh, James, thanks. It's a great forum to get going, and I'm, uh, you know, keen to share my views because I think everyone looks at it from, uh, you know, what are the operators doing, what's happening with the employees, what does recovery look like, what's the OTA market going to be like, you know, so a lot of questions around that. But I think a lot of questions that have been missed out in all of this is, you know, what's EBITDA, what's IRR, what's recovery, what's happening with debt service cover ratios, all of those issues going which I think the uh, broader community is missing out on. So I thought it's a, you know, it's a great initiative to at least have that discussion and put other thoughts out as what did we do as owners and what do we see happening going forward. So we are, so, you know, we are, an, we are an integrated asset management, equity investor. We, we, actively asset manage our properties as well as take an equity position in the properties that we asset manage. So uh, just to give you an overview of the next slide is what we do. So it's basically start to finish the management of uh, transaction as well. So in certain instances, we haven't invested and uh, we actively asset manage both in certain Aspects we remain as uh, uh, developing managers only, and in this particular instance, where we are going to share with you our experience as owners, we also have an equity investment in these three assets. So, quickly moving forward to our portfolio, it's a, a currently three asset portfolio, which is largely large, largely in India. There's a Hilton Garden Inn, which is 135 rooms, one all day dining, one bar, a gym, health club, a select service largely. And this is in Trivandrum in South India. The second hotel is in Cochin, which is also in South India, Kerala. And that's a 140 room no hotel full service. And the third is a uh, destination resort, 56 suites on the coast of uh, South India, overlooking the Arabian Sea on a beach front. So we'll tell you what we did. Uh, you know, this largely lays out the pandemic timeline as it played out and what we saw happening and actually what we did and what we continue to do. So incidentally, in January is when the initial reports started coming out of China. I remember I was getting on a flight from Singapore uh, to London uh, mid-Jan, end of Jan, 23rd, and I thought to myself, God, you know, what's going on, right? Are we the only guys wearing uh, a mask on a flight and no one else was, right? And maybe we thought nothing would happen out of it, right? Uh, maybe I the SARS. I came back to London in Feb. Uh, there were yet travel advisories now coming out of Southeast Asia, Singapore. And on our flight, at least, uh, most of the most of the passengers were wearing some form of mask. In London, nothing at all. Right? So, I, so we started thinking, you know, maybe there's something wrong. The uh, uh, Europeans don't get it. Right? Anyway, we started looking at these. We started looking at data coming out of China. We started looking at what things were happening in uh, Southeast Asia, and then we 
started looking at what we needed to do for our hotels in India. So if you go to the next slide, I'll give you an overview of what we started doing and what our decision matrix looked like. So we clearly had three issues to tackle. One was what were our medication plans going to be? How are we going to manage cash flow? And how are we going to uh, derive efficiencies going forward? So whatever we did from that point onwards, from Feb onwards, really addressed these three key uh, fundamental points. And every decision that was made was made around this, these three issues. So if we go to the next slide, uh, owning company action that really lays out what we started doing in phase one, phase two, phase three. And very quickly we got onto the bandwagon and we realized that this is going to be here to stay. So let's take some decisions then. And as we started taking decisions, uh, the situation started changing and we started making further decisions. So this is a rolling plan essentially, but it largely lays out what we started doing right from Fed onwards. We said, look, we are not gonna hire, we defer hiring for three to six months. We will uh, start utilizing paid leave by June 2020 needs to be extinguished. Any travel related training needs to be postponed. Credit policies were reviewed and focus on reducing cash, uh, reducing accounts receivable so that your cash flow goes up. Right? And quickly, in Feb, we started seeing an impact where our markets out of Southeast Asia started canceling. And then we realized that, you know, if these guys are canceling, this is going to snowball. And unfortunately, it did. And then in March, we actually stopped all hiring. And in fact, we uh, received a couple of offers that we had sent out actually at corporate office level. So those offers were pulled back. Any pay increases were uh, deferred permanently or at least until the end of the year. We started closing outlets, we started limiting services, we closed gyms, business centers, spas, swimming pools. All operating expenses were uh, curtailed in terms of uh, any related items which needed to be bought for operating reasons were uh, put on hold. All CapEx at standstill, and we started closing off floors and wings. That's what we started doing. And by the time we came into the end of March, literally, India had shut down. So India had announced a, uh, a phased approach. They said we we're going to close down a movement. It would be restricted. And then we saw the occupancy literally plummeting. So in April, occupancy in March. So in February, we were at 85% occupancy. March, we were at 78% occupancy. By the time we got to April, occupancy had dipped to 23%. And that was a rapid, rapid dip, right? They so said, this is unsustainable. We need to look at things from a cash flow perspective. What are we going to do? So we started renegotiating all, all uh, AMCs, either for price reduction or extension of tenor on the same price. A lot of the AMCs were uh, actually, uh, uh, their tenure was increased by almost for six months. So we went from a 12 month AMC contract to an 18 month for the same price with our increase in price. We terminated all outsource services. We renegotiated operator fixed fee components with all of our brands. And in fact, the brands uh, also came back to the owner community and said that we are going to defer certain are we able to actually stand still certain uh, fees, which is great. Uh, we received brand standard waivers. As you know, in management contracts, uh, some of you may not be aware or may be aware that the owners also require to set aside a certain component of the income towards furniture, pictures, and equipment fund uh, replenishment over the years. And that is into a separate account, which is only Use for FFME. So we negotiated the use of FFME account uh, funds lying in those accounts so that we don't have to uh, go in for 
capital uh, working loans, right? And we either uh, partially or fully suspended operations. In fact, for our resort hotel, we quickly came to the decision that we will not operate. And we've kept that resort closed right until the end of September. Whereas the other hotels went into partial operations. That's what we did, you know, these two, three months on our regular, you know, quick call, decisive action, resulting in a lot of hard work for a lot of people. But it really, really managed to keep us afloat. Next slide. So one of the challenges that we were dealing with, right? We now understand that we were it, it, it was unprecedented, never seen before. Maybe the last time something like this happened on a global basis was the Spanish flu. But no one had any answers to this, right? So all stakeholders, in fact, that investors, employees, guests, suppliers, grand government. So compounding this was that, you know, uh, unused response by all governments. So you had America, like something totally different, UK, you know, Earlier saying we will go for uh, masks or herd immunity, uh, Singapore going into lockdown, uh, challenging issues all over, right? India, different approaches. So we, everyone was caught in the bind, didn't know what to do. Haphazard travel restrictions. So if you went into Australia, or people came out of Australia, they said, hey, if you're not a citizen, you can't come into the country. India closed its borders. They said, if you're a uh, non-Indian citizen, you can't come in. If you're an Indian citizen, you can't come in. So a lot of challenges, right? Then from a very specifically from an Indian government standpoint, uh, limited, limited support or no support, actually. So what we saw is that, you know, very quickly, the British government came on board and they said, Rishi Sunak, I was listening to him speak. And he said, government support, job support, they're going to, they're going to let, uh, we're going to support industry, we're going to support uh, uh, wages up to a certain level, right? Singapore said the same thing. Many other countries did that same thing. And that's why people were able to retain employees, if not all of them, the majority of them. The Indian government didn't do anything. In fact, the Indian government didn't provide any support to the travel and tourism industry, which was very surprising. So that is another challenge that we face, right? The Indian labor laws are extremely restrictive. So you cannot, once you hire, it's extremely difficult to lay off people. It's very, it's very challenging to do that. And the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs actually laid, actually sent out a circular that during the lockdown, during the lockdown phase, we would not be able to terminate any employment. But that was again another challenge that we were facing, right? So multiple issues, no support, covered an issue, uh, cannot retrench staff, uh, banks were not willing to renegotiate. We had so many, so many multiple issues from all sides. And then last two weeks ago or last week, India uh, infected cases crossed 200,000 people. It just now opened up and they said yes, you can travel, but travel again is so haphazard that if you're flying from one state to another state, you have different quarantine rules. So people are not traveling. So if you go from New Delhi to Bombay, for example, each state, each city has a different quarantine rule. So although Delhi may say there's no quarantine, you come to Bombay and then suddenly you say, oh, 14 day quarantine. You fly from Bombay, you go to Bangalore. Bangalore says seven days quarantine. It's extremely difficult, uncoordinated by the Indian government. Disaster for all of us. So what did we do, right? So if you go to the next slide, how did we manage our risk and what did we stop doing, right? So there was a clear risk of cash flow mismatch. And uh, we worked with the operators. So some of you have asked questions over here. We don't manage the hotels ourselves. Uh, our hotels are managed by, by the respective brands. We only play the role of investor and asset manager on, on, on our assets. So we work with 
each of the operator to run scenario. So what's going to happen? How are they underwriting? What are they looking at? The same time we started underwriting for the next six months. So our internal team started looking at forecasts, started looking at numbers coming out of Southeast Asia, started looking at trends coming out of China. And then we started looking at what the Indian government was doing and we started working with the operator. And I can tell you that each and every operator that came back with the device with this plan came back at a very optimistic business plan. And we didn't we didn't think that's the right direction to go. So actually we went back and we said that's not what we believe will happen. And we would take a very, very conservative view. So we went back into underwriting on a conservative basis. Based on that, we looked at cash flow, based on that conservative number, we looked at what we need to do in terms of employee employee uh, retrenchment or reallocation. So that's what we did to you know manage cash flow. We reworked payment repayment terms, took advantage of the first payments that for, for some of the statutory payments that we had to make to the government, we managed to defer payment or we managed to prolong or receive extension. So we managed to do that. And again, I must recreate that we have been very cautious in public governments. So again, you know, so that's one of the things that we did to manage cash flow. We uh, managed the mismatch in cash flow, obviously. Uh, government, government orders were very draconian. We went to the court. We said we can't deal with this. Uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs has no right to impose how a private company does business. So the retail association brought together along with other industry forums. And we went to the Supreme Court of India. The Supreme Court of India came back with a uh, decision that private businesses are allowed to make labor related decisions as they need fit to suit their business model. So that's again that worked in our favor. Employee unrest was a major issue. And that's something I, I will tell you is a ongoing matter. And uh, we have to be very, very cautious and how we communicate with the employees for two reasons. One is that you want to be fair. The second is that you don't want to be caught for long seven long. So we had to read the law very carefully. We had to take uh, precise and very well calculated decisions. And we had to go back to them, explain to them that they have two choices. They have a choice of going on follow with minimum wages paid, or they have an option of services being terminated and then employees being paid out as a contract. So we had to manage that, but it's an ongoing issue. We had to, the GMs had to address it, the uh, VP operations had to address it, owners had to address it, and we constantly remain in uh, conversation with our employees. The biggest issue then came to debt default, right? So it's an ongoing business and you've got cash flow and you've got debt repayment, if you default on debt covenants, banks are not going to be happy, you get negatively weighted, your ability to raise funds further on becomes an issue. So we went back to the banks and we said, look, we have a problem. Uh, we need to work with you. And we actually said some of the banks, we were able to provide additional collateral, which was already not collateralized. And then they agreed to stand still with the banks on interest repayments for the next six to eight months. So we have stand still as a deferment, which is a great, which is a great help to us. And then we went back to the shareholders and we said, listen, we need to do a capital call to shore up the balance sheet. So fortunately, we are back to our family office and we understand long-term issues. So they were able to subscribe to our capital call and that's how we managed to call up our balance sheet as well. It's a challenging time, so you know it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Moving on to the next slide. And what are we doing from June 2020 onwards? Right? That's a big question. So as 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 uh, recent as this afternoon, we had another meeting with our operating companies 
they said, what are we doing on projecting the hull is looking? Now that India is allowing people to travel, what are you what are you seeing and what's going on? So I think uh, this is going to be a case where we are going to do rolling projections on a you know monthly basis, I would say literally, because we have no idea how we are going to manage this. There's no precedent. There. So where we thought on one of our hotels, which is the Novotel, we actually forecast occupancy for June at 7%. And we're already running at 25%, which is very abnormal. But that 25% business has come from a quarantine business from a, a ship that's come in and they need to quarantine their, their passengers over there, right? So the, on, we don't know what's going to happen. So it's totally unprecedented. Uh, so we work with the, and then we work with uh, Hilton, with Dal, with Accor to look at how the operating processes we do. So obviously, we were operating our hotels at 78, 85 percent occupancy. And now we are looking at 30, 32, 33 percent occupancy. We can't operate uh, at the same staffing level that you used to. Your processes have changed, the way people interact has changed. Along with that, we established a new mining line. We have prepared a retrenchment plan along with the communication strategy for the How are you going to manage that? At one end, you've got to let go of people. At the other end, you've got to keep people engaged and you know, motivated work for you. It's challenging, right? It's, I haven't worked so hard ever than I have in the last few months. It's extremely tough. And we continue, so we continue to provide in house training, to keep people engaged, to keep uh, them refreshed. We reached out more. So we realized that we need to focus on local community for at least dining, if not room business. So we are building a more, we are building outreach programs to local communities which are around us. We are marketing to the local base. And then, you know, the last one is enhance the cleaning protocols and i think that's what the world wants from that's what we are doing but most importantly you have to build moments of trust by being transparent in your efforts and that's the key to retaining whether you retain consumers or customers or guests or all stakeholders without trust there will be no occupancy without occupancy there will be no way and that's the cost of the recovery for us build trust Good occupancy is built great. And that's the direction that we're going to go. Right. Next slide, please. And looking forward, what, what, will, what will come out of this, right? What are we as owners discussing internally? What do we discuss with other owners? Right? Uh, when we talk to other peer group investors, right? So yeah, you know, we are looking at delivery options for FB, party with third party documents of firms. Six months back, if you ask me, Hilton or uh, Accor or Taj or any of the big ones, they never looked at delivery as an option. They said, no, this is not something I really want to do. Right? You're going to leave it to the independent operators, and now suddenly that's become a power strategy. But you can't do that without, without changing your menu, right? So, you know, menus are meant to be designed, are designed to be delivered in a restaurant. They're not meant to be delivered 30 minutes away. So how do you change your menu to make it simpler and make it that menu also easy to travel? At the end of the day, if you're ordering from the Hilton Garden Inn in a certain city, that brand is at risk. So how do you deliver the brand products? Maybe it's Deliveroo, Dust Eats, Uber Eats is doing the last part logistics, but it's coming from you, right? So you're going to manage that. Team building is key. There's a renewed trust in this activity. We are relooking at all supply channels and supplier partners. So suddenly, the Norwegian salmon on the menu at the Taj, uh, you know, may not be there. You know, got to go local. So what's happened clearly in this pandemic is that supply chain has been disrupted, and that's a big issue. So whether it's wine, whether it's cheese, whether it's food, whether it's Anything else, right? That's a major impact. You're going to relook at everything. 
products are indeed to ensure that we have sourcing from more local neighborhoods uh, easier. Right? So that's what we are doing on an operational level, right? What are we doing on the management level? What are we, what are we doing on the balance sheet level, right? We are looking at different things, right? We are looking at the fee structure, obviously, in a line, in the non line, or uh, all of the management contracts going to work going forward. That ne you never have a perfect management contract, right? Hopefully, you have captured everything so that when you reopen the management contract, there is some sanity to it, right? That's what we are finding. And also, what we found is that, you know, maybe. Uh, for Hilton, maybe for Accor, the distribution is key. They may not be that focused on management. So a lot of the owners in India and in Southeast Asia are actually discussing should we, if we own multiple hotels, should we move to a franchise model? Will that work better for us? So we may look at that, right? We have three hotels currently, we have two other hotels in construction. So we, we may look at whether going franchise makes this work. Uh, I can tell you for sure that all our operators have come back and said, hey, can you give us an exit from a performance test clause this year, right? And we said, no, we're not going to do that because, hey, this is not defined as a force major event in the contract. Secondly, if you have a web contest or if you have a GOP test, particularly if you have a web contest, and you're looking at where far amongst your know, peer group competitive set, even their occupancies and their, their revenues are following. So, you know, there's no reason to not stick to a test. And uh, lastly, we are always looking at monetization or acquisition opportunities to be deployed. That's what we are doing. So if we have an opportunity to exit one of the assets to buy something more lucrative, which is more attractive to our shareholders. We may do that. Or we may even look at buying something uh, and not necessarily exiting any of these assets. We're looking at all these options all the time. As the, and we can only do that when we have access to capital, a strong balance sheet, and shareholders of the business. So that's the only way we can do it. So really, the, clearly, you know, our take from this thing is you have to provide leadership, you have to build a path towards recovery, you've got to own the narrative, and you've got to keep the team focused. And you have to be positive. What are the challenges of the leader that I'm facing? I cannot let that out and I cannot let the others see it. But that will be more noise and that will put them in a tight situation. So every time I have a conversation with my team, for the corporate team, or whether it's the general managers, it's always to keep them focused and always to keep them on the path, and always to tell them that we will get through this. So that's really what we've done, right? I mean, that, that's what we've done. So I think that's probably given everyone an overview of you know, what owners are thinking, how we've dealt with things, how we continue to see things, how we continue to deal with things. Uh, challenging, I can tell you that. We've seen our returns evaporate overnight. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Look, Mahir, thank you. I think that was that was uh, that was really, really great to hear.